Alright, first things first, some context. A couple weeks ago I had just completed a graph recreation of a photo of a ceiling on stream when I said this. I am now going to do the same thing using polar equations and interpolation, and that is going to be the last thing that I do in this stream. I then went on to graph this rainbow looking version of the same structure in about 10 minutes. The final product is decent, it's got more color in it than just about anything else I've been making recently, and I feel it's worth expanding on how this thing actually works. Specifically, I want to talk about how this graph uses interpolation to shade in colors between lines. But before we can talk about any of that, what exactly is interpolation? Well, according to Wikipedia, Interpolation is a method of constructing new data points within a range of a discrete set of known data points, which is just mathematical rigor for a good old game of connect the dots. The premise is that we start off with a set of points and, by some method or other, draw a curve between them such that it crosses through each of said points. The article itself goes on to demonstrate a few methods for doing this that range from the curiously dull to the strikingly refined. But at the moment, I'll just be focusing on this one, a simple, linear interpolation. Which, right off the bat, could be a little misleading. You hear linear, and you'd be right to think straight line, whereas I'm explaining a thing I did to fill in the gaps between some curves. What's linear about that? Well, consider what we're doing when we draw a line between two points. If I were sitting around with two dots on a piece of paper, I could hardly be trusted to connect those two little suckers with any reasonable degree of precision. So what could I do? To start off, I could measure out the distance between the points and draw a third one precisely in between them, at the average of their coordinates. Then I could draw two more points between the originals and the new one. More from there, and I've basically just drawn myself a recipe for the rigorous construction of a line. Great. Now, let's take a look at the points on those incomplete steps. I made sure to put the first point at the exact average of their coordinates, such that its distance from either of the originals would have been the same. The same property was maintained when I subdivided again. The length of all those four distances is the same. I'd like you to think of this numerically in terms of each point's sort of presence, I guess. At either starting point, that point is the only thing present in the coordinates. Obviously. At the average, each point is represented by exactly one half, which is why this one winds up perfectly equidistant from either. Then, if we work out the average for the second subdivisions, we can see that for each, the point they're closest to gets a three-fourths weighting, while the other only gets one. As we get more detailed, the pattern persists, where the weighing reflects how close it is to the original points, and the two terms' individual weightings will always add up to one. Bisecting the two points with an average was good for the demonstration, but now that we know how it works, it would have been just as easy to split it into thirds. So long as we take equal steps between each interpolated point, the practice remains linear and we've got all the information we need to connect the region between the original two points. Thus, the jump from points drawing a line to curves shading a region presents itself fairly naturally. If I took this flatline constant and this sine wave, what would their average be? Well, at every position along the x-axis, the output would, of course, be equidistant from either curve, looking like this. And naturally, if we change the weighting on this curve, it'll just morph itself to get closer to whichever curve is given more presence in the weighting. Just like the line was constructed to always stay between the two points, this interpolated curve will always be in between these two curves by our linear method. Graph a bunch of them at equal steps from one another, and we've effectively filled in the region between the two original curves. And if you look in the original graph itself, you can see that's exactly what I've done. Between each curve are about 64 other curves filling in the gaps to give the impression of shading. If you were there when I dropped this gif on Twitter without any explanation, well, that's the explanation. But at this point, we've only scratched the surface of the applications of interpolation in graph art. We've only used a linear method here, so what do you suppose would happen if I didn't take even steps? Well, let's give it a shot. This is the function we've been using so far, just a simple line from 0 to 1. What I'm going to do is I'm going to replace it with this other one, 
Between 0 and 1, it still goes from 0 to 1, and you can check to see that any one weight matches where the other one would have been in the original line when we're having them add up to 1. But the curvature is clearly different. In the area around 0, the curve is much lower and closer to 0. Likewise, the points near 1 are, well, near 1. If we plot the points on our line like this, we get this sort of bunching up effect around the ends of the line. Likewise, using this other function on curves produces the same sort of visual effect, where it seems to get denser as we approach the edges of the shaded region. Different types of shading can be achieved like this, so long as we make sure the weightings always keep the curves between the two originals. But what if we weren't so strict about that? So far we've just been drawing straight lines between two points, but what are some other ways we could do this? Well, if we're going to change the structure of what we're doing, we should probably clarify the guidelines of what we're trying to accomplish. What we've been constructing so far is, in essence, a parametric equation of this type, where t is a variable that goes from 0 to 1. The function works because at t equals 0, the equation produces the first point, at t equals 1, it produces just the second, and at any value between those, it reflects the linear interpolations we've been discussing up to this point. Likewise, the sine equation from earlier would look like this. Now these are our two linear interpolations. Let's start by editing them such that they cease to be linear. We're still trying to connect the dots, so we'll want to maintain the first point at zero, second at one thing, but since we're not going for a straight line, we can ditch the property where each of the weights add up to equal one. So, why not square the weights of the simple line? 0 and 1 should remain unchanged, but all the values in between them should be decreased. Thus we get this inward curving of the line. Likewise, if you remove the squares from our trig functions, we're removing that type of decreasing, so they curve outward from the origin. If we take the x component of the simple line and just drop it into the trig line, we can see how the trigonometric elements correlate with the pure linear parts, all while still connecting those two points. At which point, the question becomes, what if we want to connect more than two points? Say I want to go from point A to point B to point C, and I'm using a parametric line where t goes from 0 to 2. When t equals 0, the line should cross through point A, when t equals 1, through B, and at t equals 2, through C. And based on what we've done so far, it would make sense to say that at those values of t, the coordinates of all but the relevant point should be multiplied by 0. So, let's tackle the a part first. The function we multiply a by should be 1 at 0 and 0 at 1 and 2. The easy way to set this to 0 at 1 and 2 will be to multiply it by t minus 1 and t minus 2 respectively, since at either value the subtraction sets it to 0. But when t equals 0, the value is 2, so we'll have to divide it. Alrighty, moving on to the b component, and we can follow the same train of thought. We want zeros at 0 and 2, so we can multiply by t and t minus 2. Then it's negative 1 at 1, so we negate the whole thing to solve the problem. Crossing through c is the same. Identify the components, multiply, and divide to land it on 1. This system of making sure that only one of the points is giving presence at each integer seems like the polynomial extension of the basic linear system we discussed earlier. Extensions of this system make sense for higher numbers of points, too. For instance, the multiplier for the first of four points would look like this, because of the same aims of getting zeros and ones in different conditions. However, you can probably start to see that the more points we add, the more work that would entail, especially for the more middle points. The difficulties derive from the fact that we need to specifically set each point's presence to zero at the t-value when it's not being crossed. The question then becomes if we can find a way to set all but one integer to zero instantly instead of doing them one at a time by hand. As it turns out, this is pretty easily doable if you know your way around function manipulation. Do you remember ever being in, say, a calculus class when a function that looked like this came up? It's okay if you don't, the point is that this curve happens to be pretty useful in our context. In mathematics, it's called the cardinal sine, or sinc, function, and it's expressed as sine x over x. 
The sine function is useful to us at this moment because it outputs the value 0 at regular intervals. Multiply the input by pi and those zeros land on the integers. That gets us halfway there. The other half requires that we remove exactly one of these zeros and make it a 1. Dividing by x basically gives us that, for interesting calculus limiting reasons that, while I won't go into here, are pretty well touched upon in 3 blue one browns 7th calculus video starting at about 10 minutes in, which is linked in the description if you're interested. Anyway, using this function, apparently known to professionals as the normalized sync function, we have a pretty easy template for at the very least drawing a curve through an arbitrarily large number of points. Just take the coordinates of the points and add them to shifted versions of the sync function. If we want to cross point A at t equals 0, A gets multiplied by sync t. Then, if we want B to cross at t equals 1, we multiply its coordinates by sync t minus 1, since t minus 1 outputs 0 when t is 1. No matter how many points you add on like this, we're still left with this nice, smooth, differentiable looking curve that crosses through all of them. That's one way to do it, and it's probably the cleanest I know of. However, I think it may be worth looking into a different function that we can implement in essentially the same way, that perhaps better resembles the linear interpolations we started out with. This one's a little stranger, so bear with me. Consider the absolute value. The absolute value of x is a function that is basically just x except that its output for any negative value is that number's positive counterpart. Now, consider what happens when I add a number to its absolute value. For any positive number, this results in twice the original output, but for any negative number, the positive and negative counterparts meet and cancel out. If you'll recall the previous function's goal of producing zeros at all but one integer, you may recognize that this looks incredibly promising, but it's not quite there yet because it only outputs zeros for non-positive numbers. This changes the problem from looking for a function that's zero at all but one integer to looking for a function that is only positive at a single integer. That problem is in fact also solvable with the absolute value function, because the absolute value is positive at every number except zero, in which case it simply outputs zero. Thus the function 1 minus the absolute value of x gives us a function that is 1 at 0, 0 at plus and minus 1, and negative everywhere past that radius. Put this through our other function and divide by 2, and we've created a simple, linear-ish function that fulfills our arbitrary point interpolation properties. The implementation of this one is just as easy as the sync 1, 2. Just shift and paste. The output looks like this, a more angular and precise take on interpolating between arbitrary numbers of points. As an aside, I've put a link to a graph with a whole bunch of functions like this in the description. All that makes for some interesting ways to draw lines between dots, but earlier we were interpolating lines to fill regions. What's the development for that? Well, as the second to last topic I'll be addressing, I'd like to introduce you to bilinear interpolation and how we can use it to manipulate the very grid we graph on. It's significantly further out than anything we've discussed so far, but it's an interesting take on adapting linear interpolation into the second dimension. The premise is that I start off with four points and my goal is to draw a net between them. So how are we going to do that? We already know how to draw lines between any two of these points, so that's probably a good place to start. Connecting one point to the next and the next and then back to the original gives us this quadrilateral. Now I want to fill this in with a grid, but as mentioned before, I could do this with just about any set of lines, so I want to be rigorous about it. I'll choose two opposing sides and draw lines between their midpoints. Then I'll choose the midpoints of the now divided lines and connect those. This should sound familiar because I've basically just used interpolation to connect these two lines in ways we've already discussed. I can then do the same with the other pair of non-adjacent sides, which gives us something that definitely looks like a grid. But I'm not satisfied yet. <laughs> 
I want to technically execute this in a way that would allow me to just take a parametric that traces out a grid in the square where x and y are between 0 and 1, and transform it such that the grid is pulled out to meet with our four points. So, based on those hard-sounding parameters, let's first get into why this is actually pretty straightforward. What is a parametric? Well, as we've been using it so far, a parametric equation is a set of two functions, often with regard to t, that trace out a line between the coordinate outputs of a variety of t's values. That is to say, a parametric could be called a function that takes one input t and gives two outputs, one for each coordinate. In this context, what I want is to take the coordinates of the parametric that traces out a small grid and move them to match with my four points. In other words, I want a function that takes two inputs, the starting coordinates, and gives two outputs, the ending coordinates. This is what I'll be referring to as a transformation, and in practice this will allow the same sort of pattern that parametrics did when we used them to interpolate. Now. The most important thing about my specifications for a grid transformation is that it's focusing on inputs where x and y are between 0 and 1. This allows us to follow the same train of thought for giving certain coordinates more or less presence based on where we are on the input. For instance, let's say that when given the point 1, 1, our transformation should give the point A. Naturally, since each of the other three coordinate points should output a different respective point, A should have a weight of zero at every point where at least one coordinate is zero. This can be achieved by multiplying by x, y. Then, let's say that zero, zero should output point B. With the same logic, we can multiply b by 1 minus x, 1 minus y, which should seem reminiscent of the weighting structure of the linear interpolation parametric from earlier. From there, it's natural that the point corresponding to 1, 0 would get weighted with x, 1 minus y, and 0, 1 corresponds to 1 minus x, y. And with that, the transformation is basically constructed. Each output coordinate is determined by an input point according to these two multivariable functions. The grid parametrics we'll be using look like these in text, in case you were curious. Note that the lines of the grid don't curve. This is because those lines, being grid lines, are constant with regard to their respective variables. If you look at the transformation from the perspective of only one input changing at a time, you'll notice that the inputs behave like linear functions. If we rotated the grid by an eighth turn, the lines would appear to curve more because they aren't following the paths where bilinear interpolation behaves linearly. Since we've written the transformation generally, we can also drop other parametrics into the distorted grid. Here's how a circle distorts, for instance. 3D transformations that input and output three coordinates is also possible, making effects like this distorted sphere possible. With all that said, there's one final use of interpolation that I'd like to point out. Interpolation over time. Given that interpolation is just filling in the gaps between two points, interpreting this as a motion over time isn't all that far-fetched. The slow-mo effects used in the AMVs of Lolliger Jodge are all a form of interpolating between video frames. Likewise, all animation used in this video has been based in one form of interpolation or another. For that matter, a fair amount of what I've been using is just an overtime application of the functions I've been describing. With all that said, whether you're using it to connect dots, fill gaps, twist circles, or create motion, understanding interpolation has immense value inside and outside of graph art. If you want to bridge the gap between this and the next video, head over to my Twitter where I post all my graph art. It's basically every part of this video's aesthetic in more bite-sized chunks. And uh, yeah, I think that's all. Until next time, happy graphing!